Section 7 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 1, Number 11, August 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 1, Number 11, August 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Whiz Bang Editorials The Bull is Mightier Than the Bullet. The Whiz Bang desires to call the attention of its readers to the latest book published by the Reverend Golightly Morrill, famous author, traveler, preacher, who has been a regular correspondent to this magazine. Mr. Morrill is one of America's most forceful writers, and his varied experiences as a social worker and globetrotter fits him to deal trenchantly on varied subjects. The editor is not personally acquainted with Mr. Morrill, but has been an interested reader of all his works for the past twenty years. Read his ad on page 64 of this issue, and add his latest book to your library. Tangier Island, in Chesapeake Bay, is where the natives still vote for Andrew Jackson. The island is nothing if not religious in the narrowest and most reactionary sense of the word. Only one church is on the island, and those who run it think that hell's hottest fires are burning specially for all who do not agree with each and every religious dogma they have. The minister is almost qualified to butt into the Trinity and make it a quartet. It is against the law to hold or attend any religious service not under the auspices of the local church monopoly. It is also required by law that you attend the church every Sunday, and as if that is not enough, you are not allowed to be out of your house on Sunday, not even on your own porch, except to go to and from church services. It is frankly claimed by the powers that be that without such stern compulsion the natives would desecrate the Sabbath by congregating at stores or elsewhere, and then, if the devil should happen to come to claim his own, he might scoop up the whole island population as a consequence. Roland Parks, a young man seventeen years old, a resident of Tangier Island, was wicked and audacious enough to cut church service one Sunday and to take the air on the porch of his house, while meeting was in progress. Officer Connerton got on the job and ordered him to come to church. Young Parks refused. Connerton tried to arrest him. Parks fled. Connerton drew his revolver and shot Parks, dangerously wounding him. The inhabitants of the island regret the shooting, but hold that it would be better for such as Parks to be shot and killed rather than the law, which they approve, should be violated. Among the other Puritan blue laws of Tangier Island are those prohibiting music anywhere during church service, even though the instrument may be far away and no sound come through the walls. Playing ball at any time on Sunday, etc. It may be a shock to learn that such archaic conditions exist anywhere in the world, let alone in our own country. True enough, we are the most backward people on earth to control landlords and profiteers. But it seems that the same may be said of us in regard to religious tyrants and persecutors. Admitting, for the sake of argument, that things taboo on Tangier Island displease God, why can't his agents safely leave it to him to enforce his will and punish those who violate his law? God needs no human avengers. It is an axiom that the only call for human legislation is tangible wrong or harm to some member or members of society. Just here we stop to look over some exchanges and find that the ministers of Lynbrook, near New York City, have forced the Sunday closing of a local amusement park. This will not be allowed to open on Sunday, not even at hours that do not conflict with any church services of the day. Give these reverend gentlemen credit. They did not find shooting necessary in the process, but give them debit for a senseless piece of business. With Coney Island and Rockaway Beach nearby, the Lynbrook people will simply take a short trolley ride and get what they want much better. What was accomplished, what could have been accomplished, to help keep the Sabbath day holy? A zero, with the circle erased. Any sensible man could have seen this in advance. But who has less sense than a tyrannical religious fanatic? Only a man who expects one such to have any sense at all. Woman is creation's best and last work and should be the most attractive thing in the universe. 
Clothes are the index of character. A woman is known by the dress she wears. A standard of a country's or century's mind and morals is known by its fashion plate. Some women are as long in dressing as Caesar was in marshalling his army. They go to church to show their clothes, spend more money for hacks than for Bibles, strut home like peacocks, forgetting that clothes are but the reminders of lost innocency, and that to be proud of rustling silk is to be like the madman who laughs at the rattling of his fetters. They only think of dress, and were you to steal their clothes, you would rob them of the only valuable thing they possessed. Skirts have been bloated like a balloon, and long as a crocodile's tail, but now they are meager as a mummy, and docked like a horse's tail, for fashion is a foolish and freakish goddess. A short skirt is said to be economical in material, sanitary because it is not a street or sidewalk cleaner, and comfortable for locomotion. But when art sacrifices utility in attempt to show the figure, as Venus before Anchises, or Medea before Jason, it is a matter not only of comment, but censure. Too often on leading thoroughfares we find a goddess model of fashion which is an insult to sex and an outrage on decency. The first short skirt was made in the Garden of Eden of fig leaves because there were no Parisian dressmakers present. Skirt styles today are going back to the original fig leaf fashion. Mother Eve ate the apple, became wise, and her first thought was of dress and that is all some of her daughters have thought of since. American women are willing to wear any skirt that bears a Paris label. But would they, if they knew it was a French fashion, to advertise demi-mundane charms? If good women, who wear the suggestive short, close-fitting, and diaphanous skirt, knew what bad men said when they went by, they would fall dead, or call for a taxi and break the speed limit to get home and hide in the cellar. Men are a bad lot, and women should help them to be better and not worse. There are men in hospitals and hell who owe their damnation in time and eternity to the skirts of some bad, beautiful women. Fashion is the world's undertaker, and often charges a woman a big bill for a body with diseased functions, a mind with dwarfed faculties, and a soul with a future damned. Girls whose altar is a looking-glass and their Bible a fashion magazine might well pause to ask themselves how they will look in their coffin shroud when the prevaricating preacher tries to offer some word of comfort to the mourners and what they will say to the great judge when they stand naked and ashamed, because on earth they wore the skirts of sin instead of the robe of Christ's righteousness. With the October issue, Captain Billy's Whizbang will start its second year. This little publication was created with the idea of giving the former servicemen in the vicinity of Robbinsdale and the Twin Cities a continuation of the pep and snap we got in the army. The first run of the press was 2,000 copies. They went like hotcakes, and seconds were necessary. For several successive months, it was necessary to double our monthly press order. We sincerely tender our heartfelt thanks for your loyal support and shall endeavor more than ever to merit your patronage. For the benefit of new readers as well as the old, the Whizbang will publish its first annual yearbook with the October issue. This yearbook will contain in part the livest sections from all previous issues. The back copies of the Whizbang have been mopped up so that it is not possible to fill any orders for previous issues. The demand for back copies brought forth the idea of an annual review. The editor will aim to compile the choicest poems, jests, jingles, and stories from the previous twelve issues into this October yearbook one often hears wonder expressed that the reputable persons find apparent pleasure in visiting cafes roadhouses country clubs or other places of amusement of questionable character yet the psychology of the matter is not so far to seek the young person and many persons continue to remain immature in mind long beyond the normal period of unripeness likes to feel that he is very wise in the ways of the world a young man likes to have his actions show that he is a man of the world, even though he may not make the claim in words. The fact that he is nothing of the kind urges him on to become better acquainted with the primrose paths. 
Hence it often results that an innocent young person will go with others to a restaurant with a shady reputation, either in the spirit of bravado, or to discover what the secret is. Often enough, the place, on the outside of life shown there, seems innocent enough, and the visitors wonder at the secrecy, innuendo, and charm draped about the place. The real man of the world knows the taste of the Dead Sea fruit well enough. Footpath of Peace To be glad of life because it gives you a chance to love and to work and to play and to look up at the stars, to be satisfied with your possessions, but not contented with yourself until you have made the best of them, to despise nothing in the world except falsehood and meanness, and to fear nothing except cowardice, to be governed by your admirations rather than your disgust, to covet nothing that is your neighbor's except his kindness of heart and gentleness of manners, to think seldom of your enemies, often of your friends, and every day of Christ, and to spend as much time as you can, with body and with spirit, in God's out-of-doors. These are little guideposts on the footpath to peace. Henry Van Dyke Why the Editor Left Town From the Rochester, Minnesota Bulletin Miss Isabel Jones returned yesterday from Chicago, where she visited her son, Dick, and attended the Republican Convention. Miss Jones also visited at the National Kindergarten College, where she formally attended. Free Verse When a girl walks down the street with hardly enough clothes on to make a tail for a kite, you can't expect a fellow to have prayer-meeting thoughts. Little Johnny rushed home from school, through the house and into the yard where he had a pen of pet rabbits. Picking one up, he began to shake it violently, repeating with each shake and in a rather rough tone, Two and two, two and two. Johnny's mother heard the noise. She ran to the window and yelled at him to stop abusing the rabbit. Stop that, Johnny, she admonished. You'll kill poor Bunny. I don't care if I do, Johnny replied. Teacher told me a lie today. She said rabbits multiplied faster than anything. This one can't even add. End of section seven. Section ten of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume One, Number Eleven, August, nineteen twenty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 1, Number 11, August 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Friendly Insults. By Captain Billy. There is something almost amusing about the violent agitation in Canada and England against the publications of a well-known American. The Britishers are working up a boycott against these periodicals, declaring their pages contain many bitter insults to old John Bull. Those acquainted with the tribe of England soon recognize their proud and haughty demeanor. Blood and lineage cut deep into their flesh and cranium. I often wonder if the English realize the possibility for pride in the American people. From my observation, through a wide exchange of British publications, I have noted ten insulting stories regarding the Americans to every one story contained in our newspapers and magazines of a nature detrimental or slurring to British cousins. Permit me for a moment to regale you with a few old stories gleaned from the English. Story number one. A teacher asked one of the class to tell her what the British flag stood for. Truth, honor, and justice, replied the child. Right, said the teacher. Now, Willie, can you tell me what the French flag stands for? Liberty, fraternity, and equality, piped Willie. Good, commented the teacher. Reggie, you tell me what the American flag stands for. I don't know what it stands for now, replied the knowing youth, but it stood for a devil of a lot during the first two years of the war. Story number two. One of the first American soldiers arriving in England went to a public house and ordered a glass of beer. He was not used to the non-sparkling English beer and casually remarked to the barmaid, Isn't this beer a little stale? No wonder it's stale, rejoined the lady. It has been waiting for you three years. Story number three. Why are American Tommies called doughboys? Asked a kind lady of an English soldier. Well, theorized the English soldier, I suppose it is because they were needed in 1914 and did not rise until 1917. Story number four. 
A prize was offered at a children's entertainment for the lad who could tell the biggest lie. I went up in an airplane so high that I could hear the angels sing, said the first child. I went down in a submarine so far that the water was boiling, said the second. The Americans won the war, said the third, and carried off the prize. Story number five. An American soldier met a British soldier in New York. What mob did you go over with? asked the Britisher. The Rainbow Division, responded the American. Never heard of it, laconically remarked the Britisher. What? ejaculated the American. Never heard of the Rainbow Division? The famous Rainbow Division? Ah, let me think, pondered the other. Let me think. Ah, yes, by Jove, that's the one that came out after the storm was all over. The Englishmen admit their insulting stories about the Americans, but defend the practice by declaring the stories to be of a friendly character. On the other hand, they declare the American insults to be bitter. Our friendly insults appear to be a horse of another color. What chance is there for permanent peace? The Soapy Wiggle Shimmy There are ways and other ways, but... How do you wash your back when you bathe? queried one fair maiden of her companion on a streetcar as they rode to work one morning last week. I just can't seem to get a satisfactory job on that part of me. Why, wash my back, came the instant and ready reply. Why, that's easy. I just soak my back all over and then lie down in the tub and shimmy. He. Are you free tonight, dearie? She. No, I was last Friday, but not tonight. End of section 10. Section 8 of Captain Billy's Whizbang. Volume 1, Number 11, August 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 1, Number 11, August 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Smokehouse Poetry. Have you ever sighed for the good old days before the great drought? I have, many, many times. Oh, gentle readers, how my mouth has filled with juicy cotton at the thought of a nice, large, cooling glass of lager. You know, the kind we got before the war? The amber fluid that would almost make you side-slip into a tailspin and flop on your fuselage. In the September issue, I want you to read Sherry, and then eat an egg so as to complete the illusion. Oh, tis so, don't I know, you're in for it once you begin it. As with wine, so with love, you better go slow, for the devil himself is in it. She's a Darby poem for the old-fashioned bohemian. The Editor The Worldly Way by Monroe H. Rosenfeld Come back, my child, said the father fond, to his boy who had gone astray, out in the bitter world of sin, out in the sorrowed way. Thou hast erred, my child, yet what of that, and frailty's name is mine. Thy path of sin is naught to me, for repentance is divine. And so it chanced that the lad returned one night, when the lowering day of life had cast its darkening gloom, and lured him from his way. And wine and song and kindly hands, like the dream of the prodigal son, were lent in humble, sweet embrace to welcome the erring one. A maiden fair in tattered gown, a weary and sad at heart, passed out in the rabble of the street with penance for a part. Hers was the fate of passion's love, and she a thing of scorn. Thou hast erred and sinned, cried the bitter world, t'were better to be unborn. Thou art not my child, the father said, as he closed the mansion door. Passion and sin go hand in hand, seek thou another shore. And the girl went forth forever, I, a penitent child of shame, one of the millions wandering on, for woe and death to claim. Ah, this was many years ago, when life was a youthful dream, and yester eve I saw two graves in a churchyard near a stream. The glittering waters rippled soft, their cadence for a song, of the sinner and sinned who buried lay apart from the madding throng. The same sweet carol of the birds o'erhead that sang their strain. 
The same sweet zephyrs lingered by, made dirges for the twain. One forgiven, the other spurned, both in the depths of clay, yet each again to rise despite the cross of the worldly way. Here's where I prove an artist without a brush, he cried, as he drew a lovely maiden up closer to his side. Hell. Sometimes we say, it's colder than hell. Sometimes we say, it's hotter than hell. And when it rains, tis hell, we cry. It's also hell when it's dry. Married life's hell, so they say. You get home late, there's hell to pay. I suppose it is hell if babe cries all night and doctor bills, they're hell all right. But still there's hell yes, hell no, and oh hell too. The hell you don't and the hell you do. Now, how in the hell can anyone tell what in the hell we mean by hell? By Pneumatic, Akron, Ohio. Learning. I used to be old-fashioned. I never came to town. But now, by gosh, I'm lickety-split. I love the girls around. I hug them. I kiss them. I'm a regular up-to-date. By gollies, I'm getting wild, but you city ginks just wait. Bill Bancroft. Maud Muller. Maud Muller on nice summer day, raked in meadows, sweet with hay. Her eyes bond sharp, lock good sharp knife. She bond nice girl, I bet your life. Before she bond our wary long, she start to singing little song, and yudge come by riding down big hill in nice red yumping automobile. Maud say, hello, judge, how bon you? The judge say, Maudie, how'd you do? He say, skull you talk, little ride? If you skull lock to, yump inside. So Maudie and judge ride bout six miles, and judge skull bask in Maud's sweet smiles. The judge say, skull you be my pal, then automobile bust all to howl. Then Maud ban walking bout half way back to meadows sweet with hay. I love you still, dear, said the judge, but Maud she only say, oh, fudge, of all sad verge that men skull talk, the saddest man, valk, you sucker, valk. Girls, read this one. A girl may laugh, a girl may sing, a girl may knit and crochet, but she can't scratch a match on the seat of her pants because she's not built that way. Girls. With girls you should not get too free, you'll find my words are true. Tell her she's a bird and she will want to fly with you. Cincinnati Inquirer. With girls you should not get too free, you'll find my words are right. Tell her she's a bear and she will want to hug you tight. Hastings, Nebraska Tribune. With girls you should not get too free, and this thought don't forget. Tell her she's a deer, and see, her run you dear in debt. New York World. With girls you should not get too free, just that in mind please bear. Tell her she's a peach, and she will grab you for a pair. St. Paul Pioneer Press. With girls you should not get too free, be careful, don't get rash. Tell her she's a lamb, and she will fleece you of your cash. In a friendly sort of way. When a man ain't got a scent and he's feeling kind o' blue and the clouds hang dark and heavy and won't let the sun shine through, it's a great thing, oh, my brethren, for a feller just to lay his hands upon your shoulder in a friendly sort o' way. It makes a man feel curious. It makes the teardrops start and you sort o' feel a flutter in the region of your heart. You can look up and meet his eyes. You don't know what to say when his hand is on your shoulder in a friendly sort of way. Oh, the world's a curious compound with its honey and its gall, with its care and bitter crosses, but a good world after all. And a good God must have made it. Leastwise, that is what I say when a hand is on my shoulder in a friendly sort of way. James Whitcomb Riley. The Troop Train. 
Higgledy-piggledy we tumble in, rats in a cage, fish in a tin. In evil dreams I travel again in a clanking, clattering French troop train. Chavo 8, Holmes 2 score, is the legend inscribed on the boxcar door. All things considered, I cannot but feel that the horses get the best of the deal. We stop with a jerk and start with a wrench, and the driver gets cursed both in English and French. We start, we stop, we start once more, and shut back to where we were before. When it's time to sleep, down you flop, with two men beneath you and three on top. Higgledy-piggledy, here we lie, lice in a shirt, pigs in a sty. H. J. Smith when I'm among a blaze of lights. When I'm among a blaze of lights, with tawdry music and cigars, and women dawdling through delights, and officers at cocktail bars, sometimes I think of garden night and elm trees nodding at the stars. I dream of a small firelit room with yellow candles burning straight and glowing pictures in the gloom and kindly books that hold me late. Of things like these I love to think, when I can never be alone, and someone says, another drink, and turns my living heart to stone. Sassoon. When the whole blamed world seems gone to pot, and business on the bum, a two-cent grin and a lifted chin, helps some, my boy, helps some. The Modern Version. Smile and the world smiles with you. Weep and you weep alone. Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Spend and the world spends with you. Save and you save alone. Though fast be the race, you've got to keep pace till you've spent every nickel you own. Jazz and the bunch jazz with you. Dance and you're by yourself. The mob thinks it's Jake to shimmy and shake for the old-fashioned stuff's on the shelf. Have a case and your friends will adore you. Have a thirst and they'll all pass you by. For men want full measure of all of your treasure, but never come round when you're dry. V. V. M. The Longing Search I wonder if we'll ever meet again. Upon a golden day thou camest to me, and beautiless were other maidens then. Nor was it night nor day when near to thee, but carefree floating through the yielding air. Oft in the crowd I've seen thee hurry on with wistful smile and look so sadly fair. But when the head was turned, t'was not the one, and my sad heart fed on its grief again. So runs my song, the sea in other days, broke on the shores of time and circled men, and maids whose hearts, like ours, sang such sad lays, and those souls happy there, who here found pain, I wonder if we'll ever meet again. Norman MacLeod Ananias Outdone I'd rather drink water than beer, I'd rather drink milk than champagne. A ginger ale high makes me feel queer, a claret cup gives me a pain. I'm a real buttermilk fan for whiskey. I don't care a slam. Soft drinks are my joy. I'm so happy. Oh, boy. What a wonderful liar I am. By Betty. So Touching by John Bowen Jr., STC. At first she touches up her hair to see if it's in place. And then with a manner debonair, she touches up her face. A touch of curls behind her ear, a touch of cuffs and collars. And then she's off to hubby dear to touch him for ten dollars. When you marry her. When you marry her, love her. After you marry her, study her. When she is blue, cheer her. When she is talkative, by all means listen to her. If she dresses well, compliment her. When she is cross, humor her. If she does you a favor, kiss her. When she is jealous, cure her. If dinner is cold, eat it, not her. When she looks pretty, tell her so. Let her feel how well you understand her, but never let her know she isn't boss. When you marry him. After you marry him, study him. If he is secretive, trust him. 
If he is sad, cheer him. When he is talkative, listen to him. When he is quarrelsome, ignore him. If he is jealous, cure him. If he cares not for pleasure, coax him. If he favors society, accompany him. When he deserves it, kiss him. Let him think how well you understand him, but never let him know that you manage him. End of Section 8